Look, please. Yeah, thanks, uh, Paul and uh, Sam. And, um, so the question I have is, um, so imagine we are in part of the world called Europe. Uh, some kind of lumped it all together, treating it as one country with sort of different individual, different products. But what if we think of sort of the individuals in your models as the different member states? Some have high productivity, some have low productivity. Actually, I'm even thinking that EU may be a better sort of test case than the US because I think I agree with, with Sam that there I think more about the degree of labor mobility being very important. So, so in Europe you have very high, I would say higher than in the US aversion to inequality. You have more progressive tax systems and then you have this large differential um, labor productivity across member states. So what would your model imply for Europe where we move to, f you know, basically an internal market, so complete free trade. Sam, so a couple of questions? Sure, yeah. 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 I mean, uh, the, the background here is that there there is sort of an, a different kind of political backlash that is more, uh, I would say, across, is more regional across the different member states between high and low productivity workers in different countries. Yeah, the, um, so uh, I want to, uh, there was a, a beautiful picture on The Economist of uh, a couple of months ago, I think, that was showing a consensus uh, uh, to globalization uh, in several countries with uh, showing, documenting a huge divide between uh, uh, the Asian countries uh, and uh, the Western countries. And, you know, consensus uh, to globalization was astonishingly high in uh, Asian countries. In uh, Vietnam, was 97% of the population was supportive of uh, globalization. And in the US, uh, not even a majority was uh, supportive of uh, um, globalization. I suppose that a model of this sort uh, should uh, talk to the uh, people's support to, uh, to globalization. And I was wondering whether you can uh, sort of, uh, you know, do a back of the envelope calculation uh, to see whether you can, uh, you know, using the same parameters, that is clearly sort of heroic assumption, perhaps adjusted for a difference in the progressivity of the tax system, um, to uh, back up uh, uh, a back of the envelope calculation of the welfare gains from, uh, uh, from openness, and then see how you fit uh, the uh, uh, the economist, uh, uh, you know, correlation. Uh, <laughs> with uh, and without the adjustment for, uh, uh, for inequality. I have two more questions. One uh, for the guy. Thank you. There's a, a rapidly growing uh, uh, literature in monetary economics that looks at the implications of uh, heterogeneity and inequality for, for monetary policy. Now, the focus of this literature is not so much the you know, the effects of uh, monetary policy interventions on, on income inequality or, or welfare, which is it's also, there's also some interest in that, but uh, on the consequences that this redistribution implied by monetary policy has on the aggregate effects of monetary policy itself. No? Mm -hmm. And I was wondering whether in, in the kind of model that uh, you're, you, know, you showed or the models you, 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 you have in trade, uh, would uh, there be a force um, at work uh, along these lines as well. Um, okay, three more questions, one uh, on the back and then two on the left here and then we wrap it up. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, just a quick question concerning uh, inequality aversion. What is it in the model? You treat it like risk aversion, at least you sort of uh, the same kind of standard utility function in that respect. Uh, risk aversion is a purely um, egotistic concept, inequality aversion is an altruistic concept, and we know that these two measures, when measured at, in, at the individual level in the laboratory or so on, are quite different. So uh, what do you actually mean with inequality aversion when calibrating the model? Um, so the, the question is to um, uh, Professor Antras, but uh, using what was said during the discussion, so during the discussion, the discussion said that the model 
uh, works as if there were six different goods. Um, does it mean that the model would mostly apply in cases where the quality of the good uh, produced in one country is very different from the quality of the good produced in another country so that they can be uh, considered as different, two different goods? Then here up front to the question. From what I understood was that the, the numbers that you showed were mostly in the end positive welfare gains in the end, even after correcting for tax distortions and other things. So I wonder, is there a plausible parameterization that gives you negative uh, welfare losses? Uh, and the other thing I, w I was wondering is the symmetric calibration um, seems plausible for countries that are uh, similar, like the US and nearby countries, but I wonder, is it, how do you think about comparing the US, let's say, with China, trade with China? Great, thanks for all the questions and comments. This is, uh, this is awesome. I, I don't have much time, I guess, to kind of respond to everything, but I'm gonna try to kind of quickly kind of address the main thing. So, Thank you, Sam. This was a very generous discussion. I appreciate uh, all the efforts that went on uh, preparing this, and I look forward to chatting more about the example. I think when I started to listen to your discussion, I thought you were going to go through trying to see whether the sufficient statistic approach that you mentioned that Donaldson has used, other people have used, whether we, one could resuscitate it here. I'm not super hopeful in the sense that, uh, and it, you know, the fact that we have a labor supply decision probably messes things out. It'd be cool if we could do that because as you're saying, this W tilde is not something we would typically observe, um, but it's something that would be worth thinking about. Then the other thing that you mentioned that I, it's also something that I, I meant to kind of say during the presentation is you pointed out this fact that the amount of inequality that comes out of the model, the trade-induced inequality is actually rather small. Um, yet the adjustment is non-trivial. Why? Well, because the size of the gains from trade is small. Now, we know now how to kind of beef up the gains from trade. If you put input-output linkages, you put multiple sectors, things that are not in the framework that one could put in. It's not easy to put that in because the tax data we have, the income distribution data, the IRS data we have doesn't tell us who's working where. So we couldn't do that there. Um, but I would imagine uh, that this, the same way that the gains would ri raise, rise, presumably the inequality implications of the model might all actually be um, amplificated as well. So this ratio we're getting, these corrections, I mean, I'm, I'm not quite sure whether they're gonna be too different in those environments, but it's important to kind of mention that there's a lot more inequality that could be coming out of trade that is not captured by the model. Now in terms of, uh, and we can talk about the other things maybe later. Um, in terms of the, there was excellent questions that came up. Uh, Eastern Europe, uh, the first two questions actually, I mean, I'm gonna think more about the precise sort of things you uh, suggest, but it sort of leads me to kind of briefly mention something that I didn't mention either. I think that has to do with the Asian perceptions of globalization that might have implications for uh, Euro integration, which is the fact that in the same way that we're saying that within a country, if there's changes in inequality coming from trade, uh, and, and there's no full compensation and there's variation in marginal utility across individuals of different income levels. This has also implications for thinking about the overall gains from trade and how that may vary across countries. Maybe, you know, if, if we're saying that um, by increasing inequality we should under, you know, put, you know, reduce the implied wealth for implications from trade, when we think about the aggregate world, world level gains from trade, maybe you want to take into account that trade liberalization has lifted very poor countries out of poverty. And in those countries, the marginal utility of consumption is presumably orders of magnitude larger than the marginal utility of consumption in rich countries. So, you know, it's natural that uh, individuals in Asian countries are super happy about this. Uh, individuals in rich countries are not. And well, how do I aggregate all these things? It's really not, not trivial. And I'd love to kind of play around and think a bit more about that. Um, uh, so that's, uh, you know, we can talk about the other details. Jordi, yes, uh, I, I, I know a bit about that literature. These models don't have borrowing constraints. They don't have the type of frictions that would generate uh, variation in the mar marginal propensity to consume. So I, 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 don't know, I don't think we're quite there in trade models in sort of having a feedback 
from inequality to aggregate demand based on sort of variation in marginal propensity to consume, but we might get there at some point. We can, we can talk more about that. Uh, inequality risk aversion, uh, yeah, they're the same here. I understand, you know, these are different concepts. Uh, we play around with different values of row. Uh, they don't seem to matter too much. That ties, ties it back to Monica's question, uh, which is a very good one. Uh, could we get negative gains from trade? Of course. I mean, in principle, any model that we generate some losers, if you go to the high enough degree of inequality aversion, you go to the Rawlsian criterion, that's going to generate negative gains from trade. We don't have that here because of a very peculiar feature of the model that I think is tied to your other question, which is the symmetry versus asymmetry, which is despite the fact that low able individuals are uh, uh, facing higher import competition from foreign countries, in the model those guys are actually not worse off. Okay, so the model is not generating losers, which I think is a limitation of the framework, and that basically tells you that as you start jacking out the degree of inequality aversion, there's only so much you're gonna get in terms of an attenuation against from trade. Now, I don't think that's a general feature. I think that asymmetries, trade with China would be a way to kind of undo this, uh, and that's certainly something that we, we would wanna play around with. And I think I'll, s I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Uh, two, two thoughts on the, on the questions. One is, uh, on the one about the, the, the figure in The Economist, one, one kind of first order thing to even, uh, without thinking about inequality, is just the fact that small countries in this setting gain a lot more from trade than large countries. And that's true in Pulse model as well as a lot of other models. And you can kind of see it in that gains from trade formula that a big country is gonna be already buying mostly from itself. It'll already be getting most of the gains from trade by trading with other people within the country. But maybe uh, Vietnam is gaining a huge amount by trading with the rest of the world. So that could be one of the things explaining. And then on the first question, this is kind of fun to answer as a trade economist, because, or, or maybe in honor of Ricardo, is he'd say, well, that doesn't make any difference at all. I mean, that's just productivity, that's just absolute advantage differences, and that just leads, uh, there'll be no trade generated by that, and so you really gotta get it something beyond just one country's productive and another country's not, or else they just, the wages equate that, that product, or, or balance out that productivity difference, and then they don't trade, and so then you've gotta get to the next layer of why are they trading? To, to really get at the answer to that. I mean, of course, you know, with some stickiness and so on, that may not be the answer, but it's kind of the clean theoretical answer, I think. Well, thank you very much uh, for all the participation and the uh, nice morning session. So I think we can have a 20-minute coffee break and then resume at 10.30. Thank you.